Welcome, everybody. My name is Jose Barzola. I'm here with the Mods Nights for Peace. I, it's a wonderful honor to um, introduce our moderator slash uh, professor here, uh, Dr. Maya Sotoro, who will be taking it over from here. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Jose, and thank you for your leadership on this um, series. Uh, we are very excited today to welcome back our friend Ed Quevedo, um, who directs the Regenerative Design Program with the Foresight Lab, a collaborative advisory and creative agency composed of educators, policy innovators, international diplomats, social entrepreneurs, sustainability practitioners, and nonprofit leaders working together to build the new regenerative economy. Um, a fundamental reframing of the conventional consumer economy grounded in integrity, sufficiency, social justice, and ecological regeneration. Uh, we are um, dealing with a few tech issues. So um, please let us know um, that you are able to hear uh, Mr. Quevedo um as he is coming in on my phone in terms of his audio today um there are some problems with his zoom audio uh but he has um a lot to share uh on the subject of our cultural talk story today regenerative design and public policy the new grammar for healing national culture um we are uh, looking forward to um, having those of you who are in the room or on our um, Facebook Live uh, include your questions. Uh, we want to ensure that this is as dialogical as possible. Uh, many of you are watching this recorded after the fact, but uh, if you are here, would you also please add in the chat uh, your um, water and uh, land. Where are you coming to us from? And um, what is your sense of place before we begin? Thank you. So we have um, a beautiful series um with uh with ed and today uh we really want to think about the overview of the indigenous ways of healing divides um as a response to western diplomatic models so we will explore in this conversation the relationship between regenerative design following nature's model of growth and development and innovating public policy to pursue cultural transformation and healing. We will also consider latest emerging developments in peace and conflict studies curricula internationally, especially as pertaining uh, to the subject at hand with an eye to giving participants access to sort of next generational tools for reforming global human society from models of extraction, colonialism and predation to a society that's burdened just and inclusive. So let us begin, um, and thank you for sharing your your place. Uh, we have uh, folks from all the way from Seoul, uh, South Korea, and um, um, quite a number from Oahu, um, uh, East Honolulu, uh, and other parts. Very grateful for your presence today. So Ed, um, the first question I have is, when implementing a circular economy statewide, inspired by indigenous practices, what concerns do you have about respecting indigenous ways of life? Meaning not just appropriating or disrupting, but truly incorporating um, those ways of life. Related to this, how can we use education to slowly ease our very Western cultures into regenerative, humble, collaborative, blended cultures? That's a big question. And I know you have a lot to say on this subject. So please do go ahead. And uh, we'll speak up. If anybody's having trouble hearing, please uh, advise uh, our host, Jose, who's very gracefully in the background, making sure that we are um, functional for you. Um, I'm going to. Proceed with Maya, who's always a beautifully elegant and graceful interrogator, 
to try to answer her questions succinctly. Certain of you might find that humorous. You've heard me talk before, so that I can make space for you. It's the lab's approach to these sorts of activities is this is your space. What matters is what wants to grow from your heart to meet the topic. So please be frothy and energetic with your questions. Jose will pass them to us. Um, but I also will respect the very well wrought questions that Maya came up with. And I will always give this admonition before I talk. I did last time. I hope I always remember that anything good I say is because I'm a vessel for my ancestors, my children, the incredible agents that have arrayed around us at the Foresight Lab, and the good patrons and trusting people who ask us to make the world a little better using their organizations as engines of rediscovering our, our indigeneity, which will lead me straight to your question, Maya. It's a great question. How does one engage simultaneously in cultural transformation at scale in society when you're fundamentally undoing the sins of the colonizer in such a way as that it lands beneficially on the most vulnerable communities, which of course typically are those most indigenous. So I'll start by defining terms. When you're all traumatized by 400 years of European colonization, we are all victims. And we are all indigenous. The only sinners in the movie were the kings and queens who sent these people forth. That's an overstatement, but they're the original sin. Their minions continue today to build systems to actively disable every effort by well-intentioned millions of people around the globe trying to slow the buzzsaw of the global material economy and its brutalizing effect on every human being on the planet because if you're not being victimized, your heart is being broken by the evil you're doing carrying on the colonizer's deeds. So let's be clear about what we're doing. The reason the Foresight Lab moves differently in the world is because we understand that we are a house first and foremost of healing. And if we don't overcome what I often experience as rage from the colonizer in some of the toughest environments you can imagine, which we'll get into today, if I don't meet that with the love that Father Mandela had when he said, I will take my 25 years of torture and turn it into so much love that the South African majority will be confused or enlightened and they will meet us in a place of love and we will save our country our organization lives by that credo and at the core of our work maya is the word ubuntu and there's a word in every indigenous language for this word and it means i am because you are it's the ultimate expression of love it's a life way like so many beautiful hawaiian words like Yelena. It is a life philosophy in its own self. And I remember confronting the horrors of predatory police killings for our studious, bone crushing refusal to deal with the deadly virus of gun violence in our country. I confront those things with love because it does two things. And I'll, I'll land your question in a minute which is very beautiful. Thank you for the question. When you confront this experience with love, sit with a mother and her infant child. In that moment, the only thing that matters is her finding their pain in a moment often of the poor child's rage. And why did this happen to me? Whatever the injury, hopefully minor, the child is filled with rage. That is exactly the emotional combination that we confront when we face society's most wicked social, ecological, and economic problems. Rage, confusion, and fear. A mother's love cuts through that like a loving, soft, fuzzy blade, reaches the child's heart in an instant, and makes them feel held, safe, and protected. And that beautiful 
three ordered pairs, Maya, is how we do everything we do. And I'll give you two specific examples for us to traverse in terms of policy innovation. One relatively fraught and the other interesting and equally evil and painful, but somewhat less fraught. I think it would be useful for our cousins with us today to think about banking and the distorting effect of the predatory and rapacious practices that define our banking sector across the globe, and certainly in the U.S., and gun violence. Let's use those two as pivot points to talk about all of your wonderful questions so that our friends can think of questions. And, what, and I want to I'll stop, I promise. As I speak, look for weaknesses in what I'm saying, because I don't have the answers at the Foresight Lab doesn't, we are not experts. We are brave. We are, we are thoughtful. We are loving. But there is no expertise when you confront these problems. And that's why policymakers and politicians are always wrong when they say we have the answer because they assiduously eat the most superficial symptoms, which is why things only can be fine. The good news is the Foresight Lab is here. That's the work we're doing with some really courageous people on Big Island. We're going to build a laboratory, Maya, to take these problems on and wrestle them to the ground in a loving, meaningful way within the lifetime of everybody who's here on this call. Thank you, Ed. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more um, about, you know, how for instance, indigenous or restorative practices um, might impact uh, something like gun violence in terms of um, both policy and uh, diplomacy or mediation, restorative uh, practices um, are um, being implemented to some degree, but probably insufficiently. Um, uh, but how, how do you think indigenous restorative practices in particular um, can benefit um, current um, popular and Western models of, say, diplomacy and mediation when it comes to some of those? Sorry. Yeah, when it comes to some of those uh, really difficult um, problems you mentioned. Thank you. That's such a such a good question. I will use my own people as an example. It's fortunately there are many things, and maybe that's why I do this work. My uh, my people are the Yaqui of the Painted Canyons and Windy Mesas of northern New Mexico, and the Yaqui, who were previously known by the colonizer as the Anasazi, lived in a place that positioned them between a very between a nation called the Mescalero Apache that were just warlike for reasons that have to do with their worldview and their creation myth and all things that, that compose a culture. And I'll talk at the end, Maya, about culture and our, our deep misunderstanding of it and why indigenous approaches to culture can be the beginning of remedies for some of society's deepest ills. The Mescalero were to the south of the Anasazi. To the north was a very tranquil, pastoral nation it was a subset of what the colonizer calls the Athapaskan. We stretched from southern Colorado all the way across the region of the Great Lakes. We need to that. It was a constant, sad, yet joyful job of the Mescalero to seek conquest and the constant, painful job of the uh, Anasazi to try to repel, sorry, of the Athapaskans to try to repel them. And between sat the Yaqui. And the Yaqui gesture was peace. Their life weight taught them that the passions of nature embraced the conflict. For example, when one takes the soul of a human or of an of a animal for food, that is, there, that is an inherent conflict. It is one species winning over the other, which is why you do two things before you take that life. Pray, give thanks, promise to take only what you need. It's that that life way, that indigenous ritual, informed how the Yaki approached peace. They would constantly sally forth into the 
trade between the Mescalero and the Athapasca Espaya, and they would only ask two questions. Where is the pain and how can we heal? And they held space for the Mescalero to repeatedly over the seven or 800 years that this dynamic was in play, they held space for the Mescalero to express their colonial ambitions and repeatedly gave pieces of their land, repeatedly gave um, what is called among the Pacific Northwest in Native Nations potlatch or shared their food and repeatedly tried to respond to the colonial in impulses of the Mescalero by holding them and trying to address what they were seeing. Sometimes it was because there was drought where they were. Sometimes it was because there were floods. Sometimes it was because they just were bored. And then they would hold the peace-like pastoral Athapaskans Maya. What they asked was, how can we help you be stronger in resisting? And they would do classical shelf diplomacy with the different. We teach in the best Western diplomacy schools in the West. I do not include your program in peace and conflict studies because it is blessed to have you and your fundamental gestures of conflict transformation. But in most of the big schools like Princeton and the University of um, Chatham in England and a number of other universities, they teach diplomats in short three things. Negotiate to meet in the middle and end conflict as quickly as possible. And that is important work. Negotiate to meet in the middle and end conflict as quickly as possible. That is sacred work, but it's wrong. Because it assumes that there is a middle. There is never a middle. When a mother intervenes in a bit of a contest between two of her children, she is not seeking to compromise. She's seeking to help their souls heal. Generative diplomacy, Maya, as a fundamentally different gesture, it says, using the exact model of what was used in South Africa, to keep the country from burning to the ground, so there was every reason it would when President Mandela was released, done by the spirit, heart, and soul of Father Mandela and a brilliant diplomat named Adam Cahane. They convened the truth and reconciliation process which we used every single time we intervened in gun violence. And it requires three simple things. That is anathema to Western classical diplomacy. Because Western diplomats always create an envelope. They say, we're going to Geneva for three days and we'll work this war out. Wrong in every conceivable way. The only way to be peace is for those who have been damaged by the violence to speak their truth until they are finished. It takes as long as it takes. In South Africa, it took in South Africa, it took seven years just to begin the conversation, during which no skills of diplomacy, Maya, are useful at all except exerting the kind of loving energy that causes the colonizer to sit and listen to the horrific pain suffered by the colonizers. That is not a diplomatic activity. That is a loving pastoral activity of someone who has to channel those people who do it better than me are much better at it than I. But in that moment, what you have to channel is divine spiritual love, trans pantheistic interfaith love. We have to accept that what we call religion or faith, love of Jesus, love of Buddha, love of the desert gods of my mothers and fathers, has a place in every conversation in human society and get over our allergy to saying, don't talk about religion, that's awkward. And I will say one more thing about this. The mistake is made so often, and we hear so much in our world right now around this other issue of systemic racism and the hand of the colonizer, Maya. In a DEI intervention for diversity, equity, inclusion, we have to find safe spaces to have difficult conversations. That is Pavlovesque nonsense. And I have, I cannot tell you how many times my, I have been brought in to organizations that have tried that, got nowhere, and they wonder why. I will end with this. In a setting of regenerative diplomacy where you're trying to heal massive trauma, you have to let people talk their truth until they're done, and then 
invite the offender to do three things. Home, which literally means to act one minute. Apologize. With that mean? It's a sacred act that requires grace in the user and grace in the offended and grace in the offender and love all around. There is no safe space. I sat recently with a group of leaders of a very progressive land trust who had been trying for five years to have a single conversation about bringing indigenous people into their activity. And they had failed because they never took on the real issue. And they were always looking for safe space. And one of their board members, a lovely, lovely, well-intentioned woman, said, you know what, Ed? I'm exhausted by this conversation that we've been having. And I said to this very nice European woman who has the best intentions in the world, I join you in your exhaustion. And I invite you to consider the wife of your fellow board member who is an African American. I know her history. Your exhaustion for these five years, I would live the experience from the crib. You have failed at this work because there is no safe space. You have to go to the crucible of awful, difficult, painful conversations held in love by a world-class computer that is deeply unsafe. I hope this is resonating. I'm trying to compress a great deal of things that we've learned from our ancestors and others, Maya, into a setting in which people can think about how to apply this, about why it has failed, and we'll ultimately get to the educational gestures that can help us build many more good warriors for the positive cause of regenerative peace. Thank you, Ed. I, um, I take to heart what you've just said. Um, we often speak about uh, moving at the speed of trust, and I appreciate that it's also at the speed of love and that we're uh, creating brave spaces, not safe spaces necessarily. That is, that is brilliant. That's absolutely right. Um, so I, I want to ask you about um, the application of indigenous principles on regenerative design for the economy. Um, and what sorts of inspiration did you take from healing ideals uh, for this model um, of regenerative designs for economy? Sure. What a great question. Thank you, Maya. Let's turn to banking. We presently have the privilege of trying to lift up a nonprofit that is built on the foundation of literally faith, hope, and love. And we've asked the team that has assembled under the brilliant leadership of this nonprofit to read some writings by somebody I commend to all of you. His name is John Bloom like the bloom of a flower. He is very well named. In the heart of the people who read this, this man's work and who learn from this man blooms a spirit of hope for a better future. He explores our relationship with money in a way that is extraordinarily indigenous. So let's talk about indigeneity for a minute and then I'll come back to your question. We are lost wandering in the desert of comfortable, deeply ineffective, efforts at social change because it's uncomfortable to do the real work. The real work begins with asking, what is it to be indigenous? Great contact in every indigenous society, in every first nation, including the entire span of Europe, all across Asia, through the beautiful Americas and down into the archipelago, across into all of South America and across the Sea of Africa. Every single first nation people began their relationship with a place by sitting quietly and observing the patterns of nature. They quietly, before acting on a new place, sat and observed the patterns of nature. Compare that with how we, in the colonizers' world, move to a new city. After we're done moving and unpacking and then repacking and then hauling a third of our crap to a storage unit to buy so much crap in the kitchen for economy that we have a two billion dollar industry to store stuff we don't have before at our homes, we might then get time to go outside. I weep for us every day in that life, and I live that life. I'm a sinner, Maya. Um, 
my name is Ed. Um, indigenous people observe the patterns of nature in a new place, and then, and only after they had thought they'd begun to understood, did they engage Maya in ritual. On the back of studying nature's beautiful mood, they engaged in rituals to reflect those patterns. Plant at this season. We channelize the water at this season. We look for these kinds of clouds to prepare to perhaps store or harvest water. On the back of ritual came ceremony. Everything from the convivial, literally convivial, convivial means joyfully leaving, harvest festivals, celebrations of birth, celebrations of a passing elder's wife. All of these celebrations are built on the foundation of ritual, which stands on the shoulders of nature's patterns. And then, if a native community stayed in a place long enough, Maya, the patterns of nature that turn to ritual that become ceremony become culture. That's the beautiful progression. And that inexorable link to the sounds of birds and the movement of leaves and the feel of the wind that we experience when we're our better selves as a transcendent connection to nature and often to a form of what we can rightly call God or our gods, that connection is indigeneity. And the good news is we can all rediscover this in our lives today by reading things like John Wilson's book, Interdependence, Living in the New Economy. I'll say if you wouldn't mind in the chat, Interdependence, Living in the New Economy. Chapter we're asking our friends at this foundation, I mentioned Maya to read, says uh, many wonderful things, but one of the things John Blue says is money has intention. If I take a dollar and give it to my daughter to have her get good grades, down that path lies madness. All of the wrong incentives are present. If I take that dollar and give it to her and say, put it in that piggy bank, don't understand necessarily what I'm saying, but in about 16 years, you're going to need that money to go and get yourself an opportunity to find your work in the world. God forbid, you never say job and you never say a career. People are entitled and should have the privilege of finding their highest calling, their greatest purpose in the world, their calling. Those two gestures, Maya, have a totally different intention, and that money moves the world totally different. It makes that point this beautiful chapter, chapter four of this book, um, if I recall correctly. Our relationship with money is based on intention. The second point he makes is money has no value in our hands. This is anathema to Western conceptions of wealth accumulation and consumer, consumer economy. And I'll just talk about education for a minute. If you observe the patterns of our teaching in Western countries, with very few exceptions, and there are some, our educational systems are built to spit out consumers on a conveyor belt. We build appetites for disposable crap, and we currently have ourselves surrounded by a fat, happy surplus in the Western privileged world of distraction, delusion, amusement, and, and utter insulation from anything that's vaguely uncomfortable. And our whole economy is based on that insulation because that is the hand of the colonizing ruining our lives, making desperate uselessness out of so many people who can't come across and survive in that economy, marginalizing the majority of human souls on this planet, all in service of profit, decadence, and distraction. That's the name of our material economy, and I participate in it. And I, and I, I go on the level I do, but I also love to give this to my children that this is the schizocultural reality of the indigenous person trying to make their way through this world. I will end my response by saying John Bloom's third point in our relationship with money, and then if we want, we can talk about policy to counteract both gun violence and the banking problem and how regenerative gestures and indigenous wisdom can help inform policy. But I'll end by John mentioning John Wood's uh, third point of many in that chapter. He says, we who have right relationship with money realize we are measured by what we give away. 
money gets stale, corrosive, and cancerous if it's just in our bank accounts or in our pocket. So the pain to give in a donative gesture in a loan so that my daughter can get to school. And I and I, I play the game of having a loan so she can uh, buy some uh, supplies for her first year of college. Um, or, or with the only third kind of money we have, we have only donative money, grant money, and loan money. And if we're intentional about how we spend every dollar, and we think about, and we pause and counteract the consumer pull that's dialed into us every day in school, because being successful and getting a job and getting a house just means you wind up fat, happy, and insulated from the realities of life. And you're, you're, you're suddenly immune to the pain around you. Nobody on this call is that way today. The desert gods and my mother's closet. But as you know, there are many millions who have insulated themselves in this way, and I meet for them every day, and we can help them by mainstream these ideas we're going to talk about now, Maya, about policy inclusion, not doing them in fringe little greedy side projects, but driving them right down Main Street and this in the bubbles of time. And maybe we should talk about policy side how to what the question. Yeah. Not at all. Um, yes, please. Everyone who is in the room um, or listening on Facebook Live, by all means, add your questions and I will answer them. Uh, I mean, I will ask them and it will answer them. Um, I, I do want to talk about policy um, because in order for large systemic change to happen, of course, um, the mechanisms for change, the shifted mindset, the, those things need to be um, ideally embedded in public policy. Um, uh, otherwise, it, it it is rather slow. Um, policy helps us, uh, although it doesn't move things with alacrity, it does um, help us to formalize um, important shifts in culture um, that are more just and restorative. So can you talk a little bit about how we embed uh, some of these ideals of restorative justice and healing into public policy, not just in terms of the content of um, equalization, restoration, and, and uh, remuneration, but also into the, process, the very processes of getting public policy um, passed and engaging in the requisite movement building, you know? Glad you ended by talking about movement building, Maya. That's my that's my um that's my uh, springboard. It's not summertime yet, but I'm beginning to feel summer in the distance, and, and that means if you don't have an ocean or a lake, maybe you want to go in a pool. So this this will be my springboard. I'll give you two cases. We were asked about three years ago by a brilliant mayor who deserved more attention, Ron Nirenberg. He's the mayor of San Antonio. Ron is known for two things. He loves to lift weights and he's very, and he is supremely committed to public service. And he rang us up because he'd heard about some things we had done by it. And he said, would you mind throwing the kids in the van and getting down here? We just passed a resolution declaring systemic racism a public health crisis in San Antonio. And I said, you had me at systemic racism. So we threw the kids in the van and we went down there, metaphorically speaking. We have a bureau in uh, San Antonio. And for three years, we helped them implement this resolution, courageously passed. 3% of the work was ours. 99%. Humanities major, I just checked, that makes 102%. I apologize to all of you who love numbers. Percent with us, ninety-seven percent was the citizens and the were brilliant, great leaders. I, I need to tell you how they got there. And also, inspiredly, this was well before the horrible events in their neighboring county, in a city that we will now always associate with darkness, uh, Uvalde, where we also had to go. And I think we talked about that in another one of these programs. But anyway, um, by a, it began. Uh, a clear-eyed commitment to um, Mr. Nirenberg when he took office to right the wrongs of the Alamo. And he 
he talked about that during the campaign. And good on it. He knows his city is host to one of the greatest genocides in American history. And we talked about it as though it was a win. But never mind about that story. He started there, and he realized that it's a very mixed community, 38% Hispanic, 12% African American, about 9% indigenous uh, and other uh, uh, communities of color. He had to do something or his city was going to continue to be very, very divided. So he hired this brilliant woman who we had worked with in Seattle. We had nothing to do with the hire. Uh, she was the Office of Equity Chief in Seattle. She brought in the same role in San Antonio, Maya. And Ron said, how do we get this done? And she said, I have learned that resolutions can turn the gears and pulleys of cities if they're passed and then implemented with legislation. They didn't ask the question about implementation. They spent two years working on building consensus. And it was an unanimous vote. It was amazing. And I commend you to go to the city's website and just put in public health crisis, systemic racism. You know, find the resolution. It's brilliant. It's poetic. And we were gifted with the chance to implement it. And I'll just tell you about three things we did. We did the reconciliation first. I told them we're going to need a year of conversation. He said, a year of conversation. People always accuse me of words of living without alacrity. I'm just picking that up because you just mentioned that beautiful word alacrity. That's not my favorite word in that. And I said, This is a recipe for going slow. I hope we're going to go fast. I, that was when I first thought of this idea that that would become part of our pet law in the lab. I said, You know, Ron, when you meet somebody and you fall for them, it's like, Why are we talking about this? I said, We was early in our relationship, within about two weeks. You've made us for what we are, and he rolled and these kinds of conversation. I said, Ron, go on this trip with me. When you meet somebody and you fall to them, what happens? And he talked a bit about this common, lovely human experience. And then I said, how long does it take? And he said, exactly the right thing. He said, oh, geez, why is it taking? That was long as it needs to. I said, right. You're talking about the speed of love, my brother. We're going to move this city at the speed of love. We're going to have a year-long conversation about the The only question we're going to ask is, how do we become one? We're going to teach your people the Spanish and the English words for Ubuntu in every configuration we had, and we had beautiful We had um, um, nuns and priests leaving. We had children playing and dancing. We had citizens who had never talked to each other in communion, talking about building market gardens, because this is not partisan stuff. This is not this is not um, bipartisan. It's not even transpartisan. It's postpartisan, Maya. Public policy, well convened with the skills of regenerative diplomacy. People in the community or a nation state working on this at the federal level, Maya, it's going to take us a few years. Just like in South Africa, South Africa have long, transformative conversations about what we do. So step one was a long conversation about healing and how do we become one? And we had to explain that. And that meant something different to everybody in the city. There's about 75,000 souls down there. We talked to 35,000 people. In there. That's how you do it. You don't do it by surveys and, and, and voting with dots and three minute new cards at the city council. It changed how they do everything in the city of San Antonio forever. That gesture. Step two, Maya. I just didn't want to ask the question. Kevin, how it got done by um, Step two was to say, okay, now that we know how to become one, what are the laws that are keeping us from becoming one? And we did something that they've never done. We went to meetings, and as horrifying as it sounds, we read certain of their statutes, certain of their municipal ordinances that were offensive. And I'm not going to give examples because it wouldn't be fair, but any city that you might live in, if, whether you're in the islands or uh, South Korea or anywhere, you can find language in statutes passed by well-intentioned people that the way to the impulses of the colonies. You have to scrub those out and eliminate them and rewrite every ordinance that has that. And since we have, as the company accepted, some really talented lawyers on the team, Maya, we rewrote the code books and then had celebrations of of, of uh, amendments to the um, municipal code, and people learned that their municipal code is their constitution. It's a sacred text. It doesn't have to just be about 
how long it takes to put up a neon sign. This language can be lyrical. It can be inspiring. And yes, it can change hearts if it's written well. And the lab has become really good at writing inspiring prose in its statues. And the last thing we did was we asked, is it good enough? On our way out the door, we just wrapped up this commission file. We asked, is it good enough? By going back to the process of a third, in our third year, we had another conversation. We said, now we can do a 20 year plan to continue implementing this every year. And whenever you do any municipal revision or propose a new law, look at this statue as your North Star. That little story means we put a gear and a seed of goodness and Ubuntu in the DNA of the water and the air and the very consciousness of the civic society and that beautiful little city that will never die. Wonderful. I have, another, I have another story like that, but I have a feeling I should save that story because I, I bet you have another question that will take a different direction. <laughs> well, I mean, it's all in the same direction, isn't it? It's just different um, uh, sides of the journey, different, um, you know, you're looking to the left, to the right, above and below. But um, and and speaking of that, I mean, I really appreciate that you've done so much different work with varying institutions. So you work with, you know, higher education, you work with banks, you work with philanthropists, um, you work with uh, civil society and so forth. Um, can you share with us and so many of the people uh, on the call, but also those who uh, are tuning in afterwards, are from or live in Hawaii. Can you share with us a bit more about what you have started to do in Hawaii, in, in Kohala with Iole or or elsewhere, uh, what you're uh, seeing and particularly excited about? Thank you, Maya, uh, for the beautiful slow pitch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a lovely softball. Mm -hmm. um, Folks, my, you're just gonna have to put on your your earplugs for a second. You should know, folks, about the work of this spiritually guided, heart-led being of luminescence and goodness that is by us, the Toro. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you all are part of the fan club. I, I ran for president, and I lost to Jose. But I will only say that Maya was good enough to introduce us to some of the most wicked complexities in your beautiful state, and it is now my privilege to travel there regularly um, and to try to do some good. Um, there is a place that you should all think about. I invite you to contact me. Jose will give you my cell number. I'm not hard to get hold of. I'm just, uh, I require patience. I'd be happy to talk to you about this. There was an Akupuwa'a in uh, North Shore Kohala that is sacred land that today is called Yoli. It is the last intact Akupuwa'a in the archipelago. And the Hawaii community, the Hawaii community Foundation, and I will honor our brilliant brother, Mike Katane, their CEO, saw it on the market and grabbed it. And then sat back and thought, what shall we do with the last impact of Hawaii in the state? And their um, colleagues in arms, the most well-funded, uh, most innovative public university in the country of Arizona State University and uh, the University of Hawaii system, uh, joined hands and began to ideate on what could be done. And I'll shorten up the story by saying, what we are now doing, building on that Abu'a'a three things, an active, regenerative, 30 year plan to fully regenerate this Abu'a'a that has been insulted, abused, and mistreated by successions of, quote, owners. How do you own? I don't understand how you can own a person. But in any event, it has been insulted and mistreated by sometimes well-intentioned people who just don't understand what it is to be in communion with land. So we're going to restore the land and make it a teaching institution. By we are now taking children from Kohala and our brilliant transformative leader, Alapaki Nahalea, who is one of the most, as you know, brilliant teachers that our God ever put on the planet. He's taking children there and teaching them how the Akupuwa'a works that's beautiful. He's also taking fancy pants PhDs from ASU at the University of Hawaii there and saying, how do we make this land free? 
how do we open it up and regenerate it from Malka to Batai, from the cloud forest to a mile out past the reef? And his vision and his tenacity and his endless energy and his wonderful smile and his charm and persuasive skills are all being deployed and he's working way too hard to make this happen so that this land can be gifted first to Kohala and then to the island and then to the state and then to the world as a teaching tool. The second thing we're building is world-class capabilities Maya and a regenerative design for governance. How we bring in new how we um, educate our colleagues on the human world. There are right now seven that will soon be third. Um, Maya, everything we do there is based on nature's principle that you listen to what wants to grow here in our people, in the Ahuwa'a, and in the people who will bring society's greatest problems to us to work on. And as I sit here before you, I will tell you that within a year and a half to two years' time, the world would know about Yola as a place where some of the most difficult challenges in human society are tackled, wrestled to the ground, and resolved. And I'll just mention two that we're going to be working on. Uh, we have made the commitment publicly elsewhere, and I think it again here, that we will bring the right people together and in another setting that we talk about how you get the right people to have the right conversation at the right time to resolve the most difficult problems of society and not and um, the So we will take on this issue of black violence. The constitutional means to bring the NRA there as the constitutional means have been guaranteed to have to squeeze the energy out of the system. Because I'll tell you what, the Second Amendment doesn't do. Well, I'll just say it this way. The Second Amendment is not a license to do harm. It's never meant to do that. We're going to fix that well and truly by bringing the only constitutional scholar by a doctor permission today ever to sit in the White House to the OA to help us fix this. And we're also going to fix the banking system. A few other good things. And that's the OA. And I encourage you to watch this space because Maya and her brilliant colleagues at the Matsumaya Institute will hopefully cover our work and hopefully other organizations that the journalists will. And if you want, I can talk briefly about. Valley, or we can take questions from our from our fellows on the on the, on the whatever whatever is suitable. Well, I have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we, sorry, yeah I have two. We have two questions, but I I um, go ahead and speak briefly about Kalihi Valley, if you, if you will. I'll just mention one thing. What people all know about the work of a formative healthcare organization that is using land, love, harmony and world-class indigenous and Western medicine to constantly love on and heal that Ahuwa'a on Oahu in the gorgeous place that is Kaliki Valley. There is a development there that the colonizer put up right after the uh, Second War. It is now being um, used as a vehicle of gentrification and displacement for the indigenous people, the wonderful aunties and uncles, and all the beautiful babies who live there. And we're going to stop that process in its tracks and reverse the tide and ensure that the voice of the community is designed the world class modern day set of homes for indigenous people. And it will be a story that is talking all over the place. It's once we skip the process of the valley so the colonizer has stopped with their rapacious development, as they call it, we will then tell the story at Iole. And we also have as a colleague in our work at the lab, I have the biggest architecture firm in the world, Gensler, who asked us a year and a half ago to teach them being a global anti-racist architecture firm. And we're doing that so that every building, the biggest architecture practice in the world builds, exemplifies anti-racism, and that's how you change society at scale. Thank you. Um, all right, so the, the remaining two questions I have, one of them is, you know, what is an example, if you have it, of a current curriculum um, in anywhere in the world that you feel is representative of innovative conflict transformation? And when I say curriculum, I'm speaking loosely, right? Not necessarily in formal institutions of learning, um, but something that can be rolled out, especially with young people, um, 
to help them understand how to be better upstanders and conflict transformers themselves? Well, I can only answer your question the question in six words, Maya. How much time do you have? <laughs> because luckily we have a number of examples of formal curricula of just that time. I'll give you two examples real quick. University of Vermont, a brilliant scholar named Jessica DeVent Carthew, working with the First Nations uh, community in Vermont to build a curriculum with our help. It is a, I do not, curriculum. Tennis, land, trusteeship. It is built with the help of NOLA and the funding of ASU, and UH, and ACF, and other countries we are assembling. It will be deployed across the university system and down to pre-K learning, because at the lab we have a theory that if you understand what education is, which is constantly ask what wants to grow here at the heart and soul spirit of this beautiful human, whether they're a PhD candidate or a fantastic two-year-old, the same curricular gestures of indigeneity that educate them all and help to build them into to care more about love and the enjoyment of nature and the connection with people and relegate money to its role in service of those three things. The other example I'd like to give you is the brilliant work of a man who has had enough attention, Dr. John Innes, who runs the School of Forestry at the most progressive forestry program at the University of British Columbia, which for my mind apologizes, apologies to Noah and Hilo. Campus in North America, and I love the University of Quintana Roo in, in Mexico as well. John Innes has built an interdisciplinary, nay, transdisciplinary program where he has used faculty from the business school, the School of Public Policy, the School of Public Health, the School of Law, and the School of Science and Technology to teach right relationship with nature. It's an undergraduate and a graduate program, sui generis. Every university in the country should be a path to his door. It is brilliant. And it's all fundamentally rooted in First Nations principle of both Aina, as we understand it in Kauai, that land is a living being. I'm sorry, I want to say one more thing, even though we don't have time. We are bringing legislation forward in this beautiful state of yours. Two sessions from now, carried by a brilliant young Democratic leader from Big Island, who we are advising to invest personhood in some of your most sacred lands. I'm going to say that again, and maybe this is a good place to take other questions, and a great place to leave you with a sense of curiosity, a sense of agency in your role in this kind of social change, and a sense of hope. And while everybody here is, is, is enjoying life on the beautiful and we marvel to make these changes. Sorry, Maya, it's been a tough period of time, but also a joyful one, and I'm just carrying a lot. I'll just say this. When we invest the most sacred, beautiful places in Hawaii with personhood, we will never again make the mistake of commoditizing land, and the next step is to decommoditize the dignity of human labor. We will make these small steps with the support of brilliant people like you, and incredibly gifted teachers like Maya, and, and, and I bless all of you for coming and being with us. And I hope this has been useful and that my silly emotions have not gotten in the way of, of your um, apprehension of what we're trying to do with the lab. No, I mean, I think, please don't apologize. I think it's appropriate to bring emotion and, um, you know, feeling um, passion and care into this work. Too often it has uh, been misperceived as a, uh, work that is meant to be objective and purely intellectual. And um, we have uh, too often dismissed um, uh, emotional pleas when in fact we ought to use them as um, catalyzing um, forces of energy to help us understand the urgency and the importance of this work. I'm thinking about um, Aotearoa, where I was just visiting and where I'll return in May and how they have um, given the rights of personhood to the Wanganui River and you know, other um, uh, precedents that really demonstrate the viability, feasibility and desirability of 
uh, what you've just mentioned. So we only have three minutes to close. And I'd like to just ask if you have any bits of wisdom or knowledge that you would like to give the audience right now about next generation tools for use within their own circles to move us from extractive culture to more verdant replenishing culture. You know, what are some things that um, excite you about um, what's being developed now for um, a, a more peaceful and, and verdant future? more about this. My I didn't say know how to reach me out. I'm not sure if it's with them. I think it needs to be most importantly directed to some of my brilliant colleagues who lie to what I'm talking about here. I'll give you a little bit two things, one at scale and one that's modest and small. At scale, I am very encouraged by every encounter I have with the demographic between 13 and 23. Never have our young people been more activated. Never have they been more inspired. Never have they been more purposeful or unwilling to put up with small path measures. I have the privilege of being with such people all across not only the country, but in other, sorry, not only across our country, but in places like Africa and South America and Mexico. And uh, Maya, this generation, if we give them the opportunity, to march us back from the precipice if we show them the way. And I think in some small, modest way, Hopefully, humble. The first I left, constantly giving them those tools. And I'll just leave one of my favorite modicums that is at the center of the lab. It's one of our principles of action. And, and, and I never remind myself of these. I'm sorry if it's repeating for those of you. But there's really so much to advance in the genus regenerative affection at a time. Just remember who this means. Before you speak to a loved one, to a child, to a friend, to an enemy, most importantly, to an enemy. This is the craft of regenerative diplomacy, to be able to look into the eyes of a hateful enemy, love them enough to put your words through the this three gates. Before you speak, ask, are my words true? And if they are true, said Buddha, then ask, are they necessary? And if they're true and necessary, speak then only, if your words are also kind. And with that little maxim, I think, a lot of good in the world and that may be viewed by some as quaint or outmoded or even naive i believe god the words of one diplomat that is a tonic for a regeneratively joyful super in life filled with relationships of depth connection with nature that lasts and a future that's promising which is the only thing we are should be in the business of giving to our children well thank you i think that's a beautiful way to end and um, I'd like to invite um, any of you who are here in the room to, um, you know, kind of put in chat, if you will, sort of one thing that you're going to take away that will inform, you know, your commitments or something that made you pause or rethink or wash your eyes. And um, Ed, I uh, thank you so much for uh, this time and mahalo as well to the uh, attendees and to the Matsunaga Institute uh, for Peace and Conflict Resolution, please do join us um, for the next uh, talk story and so installment of the, the cultural talk story series or the careers and peace building series. And mahalo again, Jose, for um, helping to organize them. Um, I will close just by reading a few of the comments here. Um, economic revolution requires spiritual commitment. Um, it was an amazing session. I will share your talk with fellow Korean peacemakers. Thank you, Daya. Uh, and um, mahalo, mahalo to be brave and bold in love and peace. Uh, so uh, thank you all for your time, your attention, your uh, energy. And until next time, uh, ahui ho and, and aloha.